First of all, I don't think you can disparage biology because someone who cries wolf says this repeatedly and makes a dire prediction repeatedly and is wrong. And we can't say yet that biology is wrong. Do I think that we're going to have a million dollar Bitcoin in 90 days? I personally find that very unlikely, but you can't say yet. He stuck his neck out making a prediction that will be easily falsified if he's wrong. Second, the last time that biology made a dire prediction yeah. was COVID. And he, he was right, was about, right that. about that one. <laughs> so you can't say that this is just like a doomer who throws out crazy predictions and is always wrong. He's actually pretty selective about his now that one. predictions. About a week ago, former Coinbase chief of technology officer Balaji Srinivasan made headlines after wagering $2 million for Bitcoin to hit the $1 million mark in 90 days. On March 17, the venture capitalist and angel investor predicted that the United States was heading for a period of hyperinflation, which would drastically depreciate the dollar and cause massive price gains for Bitcoin. According to Balaji, hyperinflation is happening now, primarily driven by the recent bailouts of the banking industry. Last December, the former Coinbase CTO explained that Bitcoin is a hedge against hyperinflation, monetary debasement, bank freezes, and wealth seizure. He also predicted that Bitcoin would soon assume a gold-like role as a hedge against standard inflation. Based on his recent tweets and wager, Balaji believes the time is here. In one of his recent tweets, he warned investors to buy Bitcoin and get their coins off exchanges. He took the warning a step further on March 17 when he took a bet initiated by a pseudonymous Twitter user, James Medlock. On Thursday, Medlock tweeted, I'll bet anyone $1 million that the U.S. does not enter hyperinflation. A few hours later, Balaji took his bet, stating, I will take that bet. You buy one Bitcoin. I will send 1 million USDC. The odds are approximately 40 to 1 as one Bitcoin is worth approximately $26,000. The term is 90 days. He soon doubled the wager in a follow-up tweet, which reads, I am moving $2 million into USDC for the bet. I will do a medlock and one other person sufficient to prove the point. Everyone else should just go buy Bitcoin as it'll be much cheaper for you than locking one up for 90 days. After both parties agreed to the terms, Balaji tweeted, if Bitcoin is less than $1 million in 90 days after escrow, then you win and get both the one Bitcoin and the 1 million USDC. If Bitcoin is greater than 1 million USD in 90 days after escrow, then I win and get both the one Bitcoin and the now worthless. 1 million USDC. In the most recent episode of the All In Podcast, the besties Chamath Palihapitiya, David Sachs, David Freeberg, and Jason Calacanis discussed the credibility of Srinivasan's $1 million Bitcoin prediction. They also discussed the banking sector collapse and whether or not Bitcoin is a suitable replacement for the fiat Ponzi. Before we listen to the discussion, please take a little time to like this video, subscribe to the channel, and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. Also, ensure you drop your comments and observations on the $2 million wager and the $1 million Bitcoin prediction. Everything you do helps with the YouTube algorithm and immensely contributes to the channel's growth. Thanks and enjoy the video. Yeah, yeah there is a tweet from January 30th of 2020 in which he basically predicted a pandemic based on a coronavirus and laid out a whole bunch of consequences that mostly came true. Hmm. Which is why we're talking about this. This is not just some like random person. Like he actually has yes. a pedigree and a track record. W what do I think about it? I, um, I I posted my own theory today, which I would call sort of Balji light, um, which is um, okay. Look, if you if you think about this spike in interest rates that we've had, and that Jamal thinks will actually continue quite a bit longer, there are three main effects that it indisputably has. Number one, undercuts the value of long dated bonds. Number two, it's made lending much more expensive, particularly for big purchases like real estate. Number three, it's increased government lending costs. Okay, Now, play that through the financial system. What does that mean? Well, if the value of long-dated bonds has sharply decreased, well, that's led to this banking crisis with the unrealized losses. So that's already happened. Number two, it's made lending more expensive, the credit crunch and CRE. We're beginning to see that, and I believe that's going to play out as the second crisis of this larger financial crisis. And then number three is the increase in government borrowing costs that will eventually play out in terms of being a government debt crisis of some kind. And I think it'll involve, you know, a spike in borrowing costs at the federal level and involve sovereign debt issues internationally. I think it'll involve budget deficits at states and cities. So I think there's three phases to this financial crisis. We're in phase one, and I think CRE 
and government debt are the next two phases. And I think I think a lot of that lines up with what Balaji thinks. Where I disagree with him is I don't think we can know what's going to happen in 90 days. I think that the CRE crisis is highly deflationary. It's going to create distress everywhere in the economy. That is going to lead to a massive reduction in liquidity. I think that the government debt crisis, assuming the government wants to inflate and monetize the debt as a way to solve that problem, that will be highly inflationary. But when these things play out, we can't know. I think that's what makes this really hard is I think jumping all the way to the sort of finish line and saying we're going to have a million dollar Bitcoin in 90 days because the US dollar is worthless. I think that's premature. I think this could play out over the next couple of years. We have a real problem if Bitcoin is the exit ramp Why? for an inflationary crisis because it, it's not accessible enough. It's not easily transactable for, for folks. I'm, I'm sorry to be negative to the Bitcoin maximalists. I'm generally in favor of this kind of independent storage system uh, that's outside of government and state control. I think there's just this unfortunate reality. I mean, we saw with the Wells notice to Coinbase today. They just uh, arrested that that crypto guy. Do Kwan was arrested Do in Quan. Montenegro, of all Montenegro, places. Montenegro, great country. Kraken won't let you wire money in or out as of, I think, Monday or Tuesday. And so, you know, it, it's clearly becoming kind of a less accessible system of storage. No, what's more accessible? Well, I do think that one of the reasons we're seeing the market move the way it does is because folks are shifting their risk assets around quite a bit right now to figure out where is a good place to put money. Freeberg's dilemma can be compared to that of people like Ray Dalio and Peter Schiff. They know something is severely wrong with the existing financial systems, and we are steadily crashing toward more uncertainty and doom. They just don't believe that Bitcoin is the solution to the problem. Yet, when they describe everything that is wrong with the existing financial system and pro for possible solutions, they give textbook definitions of everything Bitcoin represents. Does Bitcoin fix the mess of the traditional financial system? Remember, one needs to be regularly propped up and bailed out while the other has defied all odds and doubts that it would last this long. Let's know your thoughts in the comments section below. During a discussion, Sachs and Chamath also examined claims that U.S. regulators are trying to kill off the cryptocurrency industry because they feel threatened by it. Listen to this. Well, there's a really interesting article that was just published on Substack by Nick Carter, who I guess a guest writer on Mike Solana's Substack called Pirate Wires. There's a follow-up piece to an article he wrote six weeks ago where he laid out the an operation by the Biden administration called Operation Choke Point, which made the case that the Biden administration was quietly attempting to ban crypto. And now, you know, a month later, there's all these things that are all these steps that the administration is is taking to go after crypto. And he, you know, he lays out a bunch in a bullet point list. So the SEC announced a lawsuit against crypto infrastructure company Paxos, crypto exchange Kraken settled with the SEC. SEC chair Gensler openly labeled every crypto asset other than Bitcoin a security. Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works held a hearing land basing Bitcoin. Biden administration proposed a bill that singles out crypto miners for owner's tax treatment. New York Attorney General declared Ethereum, which is the second largest crypto asset, a security. That's a huge change, by the way. Yep. SEC continued its anti-consumer protection efforts by doubling down their attempt to block a, a spot Bitcoin ETF. OCC let crypto bank Protego's application for a nat national trust charter expire. And then the SEC just sent Coinbase a Wells notice. So, I think it's hard to, to argue that there isn't a concerted effort now to crack down on crypto by a wide variety of government agencies and authorities, starting with Gensler at the SEC, who seems incredibly hostile to crypto. So now the, the only question is, is this correlated with the stress that the banking system is under or is it just a coincidence? And that I don't know, but I think the argument Balaji would make is that at the same time, they're going to deflate the dollar. They're going to make it harder for you to find an off-ramp. And um, he actually brought up a historical example that I wasn't aware of. I think it was called Executive Order 6201, which is FDR, way back in the 1930s, actually had an executive order that confiscated all the gold, private gold bullion in the country. And they seized the gold bullion, making the accusation that private citizens were hoarding too much gold. So... In any event, this is the theory. I don't know whether it's true or not. It could be a coincidence. I mean, I think that there was a rumor going around. I don't know how true it is that FTX was days away from getting a critical approval by the SEC to actually 
even further legitimize their U.S. exchange before they went out of business. So I think Gensler had to pivot very hard from at a minimum being very pro FTX. And there's all kinds of stories about his interrelatedness with Sam and his family to very anti bit or anti crypto in general. That's Mm. clearly happened. But look, I think that this is like a lot of tin hatting, which I don't think is very productive. If Mm -hmm. you look at the total number of non zero Bitcoin wallet addresses in the world, and let's be extremely generous and say it's 100 million, there's still 7 billion people in the world. And so I just think everybody that tries to speak about the fragility of the US and worldwide banking system is right. But, and that part I think is quite lucid and unemotional. But every time they try to connect it to Bitcoin, they sound like a crazy person because they're just talking their book. I I still believe that it's valuable. I was the earliest proponent of Bitcoin, 2011, 2012. So I believe that there's a place for it in, in one's portfolio, but I just think connecting these dots misses the point. And I think the point is much, much bigger than a crypto off ramp. The point is that we have a lot of systemic shocks that are building up in the system. We have broken a ton of the systems that cause the financial infrastructure and the world to work properly. And we are just starting to uncover how they're broken. What are your thoughts on the $1 million Bitcoin prediction and the besties interpretation of the ongoing crisis and the role of the cryptocurrency industry? Please drop your comments and observations in the comments section below. Also, sure you like this video, subscribe to the channel and turn on post notifications for more videos like this. You can also check out our other videos to stay sufficiently updated about general market trends. Thanks for watching.